In our last lesson, we found that Jesus Christ is a high priest of another order. He's a different kind of high priest. The scriptures declare that he's a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, that ancient priest that blessed Abraham and to whom Abraham paid a tenth of all of his possessions. Jesus Christ, like Melchizedek, is both a king and a priest. While Aaron was only a priest, Jesus not only is a priest of God, a high priest, but he administers the covenant. He's a king, a reigning ruler. As Isaiah said, the government is upon his shoulder. As high priest, Jesus serves the things of God to God's people, and he blesses God's people. He does it on a continual basis. Basis. You are saved because he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. So this new order of priest has offered one sacrifice one time forever and continually lives to guarantee your acceptance by God. Now whoever comes to God by him will in no wise be cast out. Today we want to discuss the declaration of Jesus Christ as high priest, the divine pronouncement that he is our high priest. Let's take a moment and compare the situation under the old covenant with the glorious conditions of the new covenant. Under the old covenant, duty and obligation were primary. The primary emphasis of God's revelation to men was what men were to do and what men were not to do. No life and vitality was offered to them apart from their personal achievement. This sort of covenant was necessary because people were alienated from God. As the scripture says, alienated in their understanding. Ephesians 4 and verse 18. Because of this contrariety between man and God, their inability to think like God, their propensity to wander away from God, a covenant of achievement was given unto them. The predominant part of this covenant was seen things. It was a seen relationship. The high priest was seen. The sanctuary was seen. The ordinances were seen. Everything was external under the old covenant. It was a fleshly people and a fleshly religion, a religion that imposed upon them carnal ordinances, as the Word of God says. Now, the new covenant is dramatically different. The focus of attention is not upon duty and obligation, but it's on a person rather than a code. As the Word of God says in Acts, the fourth chapter and verse 12, for there is none other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ, the person, is the one you want to apprehend. He is not there primarily to teach you of duty. He is there primarily to proclaim to you what God has done, the great provisions of God for your salvation. The most relevant information in all of the world is the record God has given of His Son. In the book of 1 John, the fifth chapter, we have these words. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record God gave of His Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and this life is in His Son. Now that is a dramatic departure from a religion of code and a religion of obligation. Here the record, rather than being a uh, proliferation of duty, is actually a proclamation of a person and of the achievements of that person, Jesus Christ. Our high priest is an achiever, and he is achieving your salvation. Thus we have a living way to God, not a dead letter. John the 14th chapter and verse 6, in distinction to proclaiming, proclaiming a system of commandments and ordinances, Jesus said, I am the way, and it's the way to God. No man comes to the Father but by me, not by a code, not by a regimen, not by a discipline, but by a person is how we come to our Heavenly Father. It is a living way that now leads us to God, a new and living way, as Hebrews 10 says, Verse 20 states, We have what would be called a propositional faith. Now, a propositional faith is dramatically different from one that is comprised of doing and merely obeying external commandments. At this point, we want to contrast the law with the gospel, 
the old covenant with the new covenant and works with grace. In a summary fashion, the high priesthood of Christ has directly to do with this. Under a system of law, the principle of which was the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, the tables of stone, as they are called, the arrangement was this. Romans, the tenth chapter and verse five, says that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Again, in Galatians, the third chapter and verse 12, it is written, the man that doeth them shall live by them. Now the promise of life under the law was based upon your ability to do everything God said, do it perfectly without deviation whatsoever. The law gave you no resources, gave you no abilities, and allowed for no mistakes. The law said, run, John, run. But then it gave you neither feet nor hands. It gave you no inert ability to keep God's law. You were on your own. You had to develop the basis or foundation for your acceptance with God. If you did everything God said, you would be accepted by Him. You had to mint the coinage to appropriate life. You had to create the basis for God accepting you. Now the gospel, and we praise God for this, is significantly different. The gospel is a system of faith and therefore is comprised of a word of faith. It's a word that's addressed to your heart and mind and challenges you to believe what the Lord has done. In Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 6 through 8, the apostle delineates this great truth. Rather than challenging you to achieve something, he's going to exhort you to believe something. Romans 10, verses 6 through 8, But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, Who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Now were we to base your acceptance with God upon the basis of your achievement, you must achieve these things. You must go up to heaven and bring Christ down, or go down into the bowels of the earth and bring Him up. You must yourself be responsible for Christ becoming incarnate, for the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, and you must be responsible for raising Him from the dead. These are the two works that God required for your justification, for your acceptance before Him. The coming of Christ into the world and the raising of Him from the dead. But the word which we preach, Paul says, does not challenge you to achieve the requirements. It challenges you to believe that they have been met, that God has sent Jesus into the world and he has raised him from the dead. And if you believe that, you shall be saved. Now here is the word in Romans the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10. We make no apologies for the presence of this text in Scripture. And I would hasten to remind you that this is addressed to believers, to Christians, to those that are in Christ that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Here in this case you simply acknowledge the truth of what God has done. Jesus Christ has wrought what is necessary for you to be accepted by God, for you to be received into the family. He has formed the basis for your acceptance. This is a message of achievements, not possibilities. Jesus Christ is Lord, and you confess He is Lord. God has raised Him from the dead, and you confess that He has raised Him from the dead. Now in a propositional faith, God achieves and you believe. Remember those words. God achieves and you believe. And the gospel is a record of divine achievement. Something that God has done. Let's go over the gospel for a moment. The gospel tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 and 19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. 
Now he is committing the word of reconciliation to mankind and saying, Be reconciled to God. I've reconciled you in the death of my Son. It's an accomplished reality, but you've got to receive it. Again in Hebrews 9 and verse 26, now notice the language of accomplishment. The word of faith that we preach is not here's what you do, it's here's what God has done, and what you do is based upon what God has done. The Word of God says, Once in the end of the world, Christ appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. Now, He did put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And if you will believe this and embrace it by faith and respond accordingly, sin will lose its dominion over you. Not because of what you've done, but because you've based your doing upon what Christ has done. Let's take another truth of Scripture. In Hebrews, the second chapter, in verse 14, the destruction of Satan is proclaimed as to have been accomplished in the death of Christ. It is stated there that Christ through death might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Well, Jesus died. He gave his life a ransom for many to be testified in due time. There's no question about that. And through his death, Satan was destroyed, rendered impotent in the matter of keeping people out of heaven. If you will become identified with Jesus, Satan becomes impotent. He's impotent in the realm of faith, and he's invincible in the realm of unbelief, if you can receive it. Another glorious statement concerning the gospel, a statement of accomplishment, of achievement. He has spoiled principalities and powers, spoiling them and triumphing over them in the cross. Colossians 2 and verse 15, an accomplished fact. The handwriting of ordinances that was against you, the law of God that contained a record that itemized your sin and specified your guilt. It was against you, identified you as a sinner. Colossians 2.14 says Jesus blotted it out. The record that was against you has been blotted out and nailed to the cross. That's an achievement. And if you come into Christ, the law cannot and will not condemn you. Prior to being in Christ, the law condemned you. But when you come into Christ, the mouth of the law is stopped and it can no longer condemn you. That's an achievement, an accomplishment. Remember in Galatians, the third chapter and verse 13, he reaches back into that historical occasion when Jesus was crucified. And he says, he was made to be a curse for us. That took place in the past and freed you from the curse. You believe that accomplishment. Again, in Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10, uh, to reiterate that, that if you confess with your mouth these things and believe them in your heart, God has made a commitment that you'll not be lost. In Romans, the 8th chapter, in verse 3, commenting on the administration of the law, he says, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sin for flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. You couldn't do it. God did do it. He condemned sin in the flesh. He laid on him the iniquities of us all. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, took the responsibility for your iniquity. God did it, and if you'll believe it, it can be yours, dear person. All of these things are accomplishments, achievements. All are required for man's acceptance. Sin had to be put away. Satan had to be destroyed. It had to be done if man was going to be accepted. The word of the gospel is, it has been done. Jesus has done it. Satan has attacked the church with a barrage of distraction. He has done this because the message that is proclaimed to the church and through the church is such a marvelous message that once it's embraced, it renders an impact that boggles the mind upon people. If people can ever see the truth of Jesus Christ and what He has done, sin will become repulsive, and they will become determined as much as in them lies to land safely on that heavenly shore. They will press through fire and water, if necessary, to be with their Lord Jesus Christ and reign with Him forever. So to subvert this, Satan has distracted people with various things. The language of distraction is itemized in Revelation, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 3. Now, we don't want to get into specifics what the symbolism here all signifies. That's not the point of the passage. Follow me. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. 
And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as of a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. One other phrase, talking about the same phenomenon. Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 15 and 16. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now the point of these texts is not to try and identify precisely what the locusts are and precisely what the flood is. The point is that Satan is trying to carry the church away with distraction. He's trying to divert her attention any way he can from the glorious salvation that's in Christ Jesus. You must never forget the commitment of Jesus. What he said was the truth. He spoke speaking of the manner of death he would die. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Satan seeks to distract men from looking at Jesus. You remember Moses, when he lifted up that brazen serpent in the wilderness, it says, whosoever looked, lived. Now, if Satan can keep you from looking, he'll keep you dead. But if he can't keep you from looking, you'll live. The flood, the locusts, these are all scriptural ways of depicting an effort of distraction. Satan is incensed against the, against the righteous one and is attempting to devo- distract people from the Lord of glory. If Jesus can ever capture your attention, he'll capture your heart. Well, someone may say, What has all of this to do with the high priesthood of Christ? Why talk about these things? Well, as the scripture says, much every way. In Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verses one and two, the apostle says, now of the things which we have spoken, and he has spoken a lot of things. He's spoken about falling away. He's spoken about going on to perfection. He's spoken about being accepted of God. But of all the things we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is in the right, who is at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. The high priesthood of Christ has to do with everything. God has offered us a person. He has taken our need, our dramatic need, and he has said, I have met the need. What I have to offer you is not a set of commandments. What I have to offer you are not some external goals. What I have to offer you is not a way of life. What I offer you is a person, my only begotten son. Everything I have to give is in Christ. Everything. I have nothing to give that's outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the significance of him being a high priest. It's in him that all spiritual blessings reside. God has invested the son with authority to give eternal life to whoever he desires. And he desires to give it to whoever will ask. Now the word of God says that Jesus has been declared to be high priest. He has been declared to be high priest. That is the conclusion of God's dissertation to mankind. I have a high priest. Everything is in him. Now let's see the significance of that. Of old time, when the concept of a high priest was being developed, he ministered in the holiest place. There he stood before God, representing the people. Their names upon stones in the breastplate. Their names upon the stones that gathered the ephod together at the top. His heart and his mind uh, were upon the children of Israel to represent them before God. Before he began his ministry, before he stepped in, the atonement had to be complete. A sacrifice had to be offered, a satisfactory sacrifice. And when he entered into the holy place, that high priest of old, he entered in because the atonement had been complete and he went in to apply the blood of the atonement. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter and verse 7, commenting on that priesthood of old time, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The high priest came in to offer a completed, accomplished sacrifice. 
to take the requirement and present it before God. Now, dear student, the fact that Jesus Christ has been declared high priest is itself proof that the atonement has been completed, that God has been satisfied concerning your sin. There is not one iota more you can pay in that debt. You cannot satisfy God concerning your sin any more thoroughly than He already has been satisfied. The atonement has been complete, and Jesus has now stepped into the very presence of God to apply the blood that has already been offered. The high priesthood. What a glorious proof that he has seen the travail of Christ's soul and has been satisfied. The only question that concerns you at this point is, have you been satisfied? God has seen the travail of Christ's soul. He has accepted the sacrifice. He raised him from the dead to confirm that. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. God is satisfied. God requests no more sacrifice than that. No more bloody sacrifice. What do you require? Are you satisfied with it? Are you pleased with Christ like God is? If you are, He will minister for you. The high priesthood of Christ is the other side of divine exaltation. The first side of Christ's exaltation, the coin of His exaltation, if I may use that term, is His kingship. Now the apostle preached this on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter as he opened up what had happened to Jesus Christ following his resurrection. Verse 29 of Acts 2. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher as with us unto this day. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Here Peter proclaims that Jesus Christ being raised from the dead answered that Davidic prophecy of one sitting and reigning upon his throne. The reign of Jesus is not a military reign. It's not a political reign. It's a reign in order to salvation. He is reigning as high priest. Remember, he's a king priest, a reigning priest like Melchizedek was. He is reigning to assure that your faith is not in vain, to assure your labors are not in vain. After all, the word of God says to you in divine commitment, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It is not in vain because of the high priest, not because of its inherent worth. Our high priest ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus Christ has been made head of all things to the church, as Colossians 2.10 says. And Peter proclaims he's gone into heaven, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. But the other side of that coinage of divine exaltation, the other side of him being exalted to the right hand of God is his high priesthood. The first side, the kingship, guarantees the security of every soul that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and walks the path of obedience. They're guaranteed acceptance. The second side, the high priesthood, guarantees that what God has promised will come to you, that the blessings of the covenant will come to you. I will write my law in their hearts, God says. I will put it in their minds. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. They shall no more see every man to his neighbor. Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's God's commitment in Hebrews 8, verses 10 through 13. And it actually takes place because of our high priest. Our high priest gets the law written on your heart. Our high priest administers the law written in your mind. Our high priest brings you into acquaintance and familiarity with the living God. And so it is that as high priest, he not merely reigns, he commits to you the things God has reserved for them that love him. His high priesthood is a guarantee of your participation. This is life eternal, Jesus said in his hallmark prayer of John the 17th chapter, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus is the administrator of that knowledge. Thus we do have a high priest 
after the order of Melchizedek different and effective with an eternal basis. Now let's draw a few conclusions. The high priest did not begin his ministry in the holy place until the atonement had been made, until God had been satisfied with a sacrifice. He then applied what had been achieved. Now this is actually what Hebrews 1 and verse 3 tells us. It proclaims the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the basis of His sacrifice, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There he is administering as a high priest because the sacrificial atonement has been completed. The proclamation is that Jesus is now ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. He's ministering there for you and to you. In behalf of God he's doing it and he's representing you to God. This means that the required sacrifice has been accomplished. God has approved it. If you will accept it, God will not question your acceptance. Jesus is now administering the benefits of that sacrifice to all that have faith in it. Well, someone says, you, are you teaching an easy believism? No. Faith is one of the most hard taskmasters that you can have. Once in your heart you have been convinced and persuaded that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He has accomplished the atonement that you require, that has a moral power about it that moves you in the path of obedience. It does what the law couldn't do. No amount of commandments can get you to love God. But once you see the love of Christ, you will confess, like John did, I love him because he first loved me. You will confess like Paul, he loved me and gave himself for me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you among those receiving the benefit of Christ's high priestly ministry? There is no reason why you cannot be. Be up, be up and believing in your high priest.